Welcome, Hudson Valley, to this week's edition of In Touch, the public affairs and issues program that runs across Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley radio stations. This week's guest is Nick Brule, author and illustrator of the children's book series, Bad Kitty. The Poughkeepsie Public Library District will be holding a book fair on April 1st, and Nick Brule will be one of the featured authors at the event. On this episode, we talk about the legacy of the Bad Kitty series, Nick Brule's inspiration and process, and the importance of local book festivals like these. We invite you to join us and listen to a previously recorded conversation between Nick Brule and myself here on In Touch. Hello, Hudson Valley. You're listening to In Touch, Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley's public affairs and issues program. We have a great episode for you today. Honestly, I think this is really cool personally because it has a connection to my childhood and potentially yours or your child's. You know, With us today, we have award-winning author and illustrator known best for his works with the Bad Kitty series. We have author Nick Brule. Nick, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on your show. I am really happy to have you here. It's terrific to be able to speak with you today. reason that Nick is on today, besides being a very accomplished author and illustrator, Nick is going to be one of the featured authors at the Poughkeepsie Public Library District's book fair happening April 1st, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And that's going to be held at Dutchess Community College's Falcon Hall, which that should be a very exciting event. And we'll get into the event itself in a little bit. But I want to talk more about you and your books. One thing that we said before we started recording, when the first Bad Kitty book came out, I was about seven years old and I remember reading Bad Kitty. And I think I read a couple others afterwards when I heard that I was like talking with you today. It's like, Bad Kitty, that sounds so familiar. And it took me back down memory lane when I was getting ready for this interview. So I thought that was really cool. You were saying how it was interesting, the longevity and the legacy that Bad Kitty has had. And I would love for you to go into that for us. Sure, Connor. You know, this has been happening more and more recently, and it does speak to Kitty's longevity. But, you know, my readership, they, you know, they say my target audience is, you know, second, third and fourth graders. So what happens is my readership is going to change every three to four years. Kids will outgrow them, but new kids uh, grow into them. But now Kitty is approaching 20 years old. Uh, 2025 will be the 20th anniversary of the the first book of uh, Bad Kitty, the picture book. So it means that Kitty's actually spanned an entire generation now. So I just got back from a mini book tour where I drove as far south as D.C. and back up north. And on at least three occasions, I've run across grown-ups who worked in the bookstores where I appeared who themselves knew Bad Kitty from their own childhood. Not, not from having bought them for their children, but from their own childhood. And, 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 and uh, I, I love that. And it's a very recent phenomenon. It's just a matter of time now where people are going to talk about, you know, how they're buying um how, how their grandchildren are going to be buying Bad Kitty. So it's it's um, it's been neat. It's been a nice ride so far. That's incredible. I just think it's a testament of the work that you've been able to put into this and how you've been able to have it connect to audiences all these years. And it speaks to children in a really awesome way. So let's bring it back, like beginning. What got you into writing and illustrating in the very first place before Bad Kitty was even a thought in your mind? Yeah, sure. I, I ever since college, I'd had this passion to be a cartoonist. And I should say, even when I was a child, I had this passion to be a cartoonist. And cartoons are essentially just, just small stories that are both written and illustrated. Even a single panel in a New Yorker cartoon, for instance, you know, there's a story there that's just being told very briefly with a single panel and a single illustration. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to have a comic strip in the newspaper. And I had a comic strip uh, at my college, Haverford College, outside of Philadelphia for about two years. And I love that. This became my passion. So for years after college, I was trying to break into a career of cartooning. And in order to supplement this radical lifestyle I've been developing for myself, uh, I found myself working in bookstores. 
So for over 15 years, I worked in book retail. For the last seven of them, I worked at a children's bookstore in New York called Books of Wonder. That's where it suddenly occurred to me that I could put these two disciplines together. I can do my my passion for cartooning alongside my uh, new interest in children's books. And once I did that, I started creating manuscripts, you know, using my sensibilities as a cartoonist, and that's when it happened quickly. I found my agent, uh, Jenny Dunham, was um, a regular customer at the store. Uh, the man who had become my editor for, for the, my first 12 years of my career uh, was a good friend of the store manager. Uh, so uh, that's how I fell into this wonderful career that I have. That's terrific. And it's really cool to see the progression that you had with that. So tell us then, how did Bad Kitty get started then? What was the inspiration? Is it based off your cat that you had at the time? Was it based off somebody that you knew? Where did this come from, this cute little kitty? You know, I didn't even have a cat at the time when I came up with the idea. (laughs) Uh, And and I wish I had a more interesting story than the one I'm going to share with you. And one of these days, I'm just going to sit down and and, and just fabricate something that will really captivate an audience. But the truth is, (laughs) I use a, a creative exercise for myself when I have to come up with story ideas in which I think of the title first. So before I think of the story, the, the 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 plot, the character, anything, I think of the title first. So what happened was about, you know, 22, three years ago, I was sitting at my table with a big blank sheet of paper with a pen in my hand. And instead of writing a story, I wanted to come up with interesting titles, titles that just had one or two words, titles that I'd never seen before or, or didn't think even existed. And so I just started writing them down. While I was doing that, I came up with those words, bad kitty. And I thought, oh, you know what? I don't think I've seen a picture book like this. This could be a lot of fun. What could it be about? Well, it could be about a cat that does something bad. And I started thinking about all the different bad things the cat would do. And I came up with so many ideas. I thought it would be interesting if I put them into alphabetical order. So I thought, oh, this is interesting. So now let me ask myself, why? Why would this cat do all these terrible things? And knowing cats as I did, their behavior is often influenced by their food. So I thought, okay, you know what? I'll do a, an alphabet of weird foods that this cat is given but doesn't like. And that's how the book took shape. Now, the character herself is modeled after a cat I had when I was a little boy named Zuzu, um, the, the, the cat was named Zuzu, not me. Anyway, uh, (laughs) Zuzu was this awesome little cat that had this elegant design where she was all black from the tip of her tail to the tip of her ears, except for this tuft of white fur on on her chest. So she became the physical model. Uh, Her personality, however, uh, is just sort of based on all the various cats and and, and, uh, that I've known throughout my life. That's very cool. I really like that inspiration. Again, you're listening to In Touch, Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley's public affairs and issues program. We are speaking with award-winning author and illustrator, best known for the series, Bad Kitty, Nick Brule. We've been talking about the early days getting into becoming an author and illustrator, uh, the inspiration of just loving cartoons, and how eventually the character of Bad Kitty was created. Now, one thing about Bad Kitty I want to ask about, I believe I read somewhere that you don't necessarily look at Bad Kitty as a cat per se, but you kind of look at her as more like a child in a sense. Is that true? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, it makes sense, right? Because even though I am writing books about cats, cats are not my target audience. Uh, Kids are. So, uh, yeah, the the books, I do think of Kitty as being like a little kid who happens to be shaped like a cat. But having said that, I don't want Kitty to be strictly an anthropomorphized creature who is simply like a kid wearing a, a, a cat costume, right? Yeah. She is still very much a cat. She uses a litter box. She licks herself to keep clean. Meows. She doesn't talk. Yep. Uh, it, it constrains it, 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 it challenges me, actually, because it constrains her stories into the world where a cat would be, which is 
for the most part, inside a single setting, the house. So she's not going to be flying off to space or going off on a pirate <laughs> ship and that sort of thing. I wish I I was brave enough to just simply dispense with this little rule that I made for myself where she really is a cat. Um, but I don't. Now, having said that, the next book is going to be Bad Kitty Makes a Movie, where she and Uncle Murray <laughs> go to Hollywood, right? Uh, <laughs> but she is still a cat. <laughs> And that's awesome. I just think that's really cool the way that you go about it, because one might think is like, oh, it's just thinking of a rambunctious cat or something. But the fact that you add that little element in it really uh, personalizes the character while, of course, just maintaining that she is a cat. And I think that's really great. Uh, What a wonderful way to still be able to connect with the kids and keep that through the series as it keeps going. Now, Bad Kitty has a number, it has a variety of different books. You have the typical picture books, but you also have chapter books. And don't you have like graphic novels technically of of Bad Kitty as well? You have it in a number of formats, don't you? Well, you know, they initially started as these heavily illustrated chapter books. Uh, and, and so, for instance, the first in the this, in this chapter book series is Bad Kitty Gets a Bath. And it was Kirkus Reviews who designated it a graphic hybrid, which, which made sense because I didn't use a lot of the graphic novel and comic book tropes in order to tell that story. So there are very mm-hmm. few, if any, um, panels, word balloons things like that within that book to tell the story. It kind of happened organically, all on its own, without my really even trying. And, and, and it happened fairly subtly. I think this is, I would say starting around book nine or 10 with, with Bad Kitty Takes the Test, I started changing the way I was telling these stories. And I started using panels more and more and more. I started using word balloons more and more and more. And part of that was in order to tell the stories, I started using more and more characters and characters that spoke and interacted with Kitty. So now, yes, they are. Uh, the most recent one is Bad Kitty Super Cat, and, and they are undeniably graphic novels while still being in the same series that started with Bad Kitty Gets a Bath. I think that's great to see the evolution over time while, you know, the way you're telling the story changes slightly. But, you know, the the elements and the core of what you're writing about is there. So new and old audiences can engage with it the same way, which very, very good to see. So you have a lot of books in the Bad Kitty series. How many are you up to now? Do you do you know off the top of your head? In terms of chapter books, Bad Kitty Super Cat, I believe, is number 17, which is gotcha. kind of wild. But then you consider all those sort of the early picture books like Bad Kitty and Poor Puppy and Bad Kitty Christmas. And I have these sort of early readers, which are shaped like a square. They're either eight inches by eight inches or nine by nine. And they are things like Bad Kitty Does Not Like Snow, Bad Kitty um, Does Not Like Video Games, Bedtime for Bad Kitty. But I wanted to make one more mention about the chapter books and the graphic novels yeah. uh, because I've been looking at this myself and really trying to figure out how this came about because it just sort of happened without my trying. And I kind of suddenly realized that graphic novel storytelling was an inevitable direction for me to take. And partly it's because my own ability to tell a story was evolving. I, I was getting a little better because one of the things that graphic novels can do is I can actually pace the way the story is told. And and, and a very simple formula would be the more panels I have on a page, the slower the storytelling. So I can really use the pacing of how I tell the story to create drama. I can slow it down with more panels and you can turn the page and it's a two page spread that that just hits the reader in the face. So Mm. it was something I sort of toyed with early on but never really contemplated. Now I feel like I've finally fallen into the way I like to tell a story. And it turns out it's great. It's the stuff that I always read since I was a kid, (laughs) which was the comic books and the graphic novels. Well, I guess that should make a lot of sense then. And it's great that you've been able to fall into that then to be able to find, you know, your groove and to feel that you are, you know, comfortable in what you're writing. That's terrific. So with Bad Kitty, 
with everything that you do, what is it specifically that you want kids and audiences to get out of the series? You know, I think it depends on the book. Uh, You know, one thing that I think makes any uh, children's book series uh, successful is you never really want to fall into the trap where you're putting the message of the story ahead of the storytelling itself. Mm. Right? You know, kids are getting lectured every day, all the day long, you know, about what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. You know, their their lives are just filled with lessons. That's what school's all about. So while there are messages and lessons in the books, um, my priority always has been and always will be to just amuse the kids, to to give them something that will entertain them. Now, you know, I'm going to pepper it all with, you know, something that I think is important, like Bad Kitty Takes a Test is all about the folly of, of um, standardized testing, at least in my estimation. Uh, Bad Kitty Kitten Trouble is all about the refugee crisis, really. Mm. Uh, Bad Kitty for President is all about learning about our weird and wonderful electoral process. And and even Bad Kitty Super Cat is all about play dates and socializing. And next year's Bad Kitty Makes a Movie is, is going to be all about identity, right? It's the difference between plot and theme. I Theme has to be there, but boy, the plot is my focus because... Uh, I want kids to be able to open up one of my books and just fall into the funny and into the humor and into the storytelling. And if they get something out of it beyond all that, great. But that's never been my priority. I'm really glad that you said that, that you take plot over theme. I feel that's something authors do a much better job with recently, um, especially when you come to watching TV or watching movies. I feel like the overall theme or um, they're trying to spoon feed an audience something, but then they forget about the plot and the plot's really not that great. But I, I love the fact that you focus on the plot and you try to entertain the kids, you try to entertain the audiences, and that remains number one for you. I think that's great. Uh, you know, thank you for doing it. It's it's a great thing to be able to continue to go for. So speaking of audiences, audiences will get a chance to see you at the Poughkeepsie Public Library District's book fair happening April 1st. Now, first of all, I got to ask, how many of these public book fairs uh, do you get to do often? I know you said you had a book tour, but like something of this size and scale. Uh, book festivals are getting to be more and more common, which is is terrific. You know, there are really two seasons for it. There's the fall season and there's the spring season. What's nice about Poughkeepsie is that it falls into the spring season because there aren't too many book festivals uh, that fall into the spring. It, it, it's almost always autumn, right? Mm. So that's kind of nice about the Poughkeepsie one, that alone. But for the most part, you know, book festivals are interesting things because for the they've usually had this sort of national prominence, right? There's always been things like the Miami Book Festival and the National Book Festival and the LA Times Book Festival and stuff like that. And these are the festivals that introduce that 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 bring in authors from all over the country, all over the world. What's happening, what's been happening in the last 10, 15 years, and it was of course interrupted by the pandemic, were these smaller, localized, sort of hometown book festivals. And those are so much more fun. It's a much more intimate gathering. I really get the opportunity not just to speak to the readers who come to the table and they want to chat, but also to my fellow authors and illustrators who, you know, none of us ever get to really talk to each other. Right. We, we, we all you know, work inside our own little world, our own little uh, hobbit hole. Right. We don't get out as often as you like. And so these festivals are really one of the only opportunities we ever get to see each other. That's terrific. That is something like I've never really 
thought of before in regards to that where it's you know it's the time for you guys to meet each other well with me for instance uh audio engineering society conference was the one time get to see all the producers and engineers and that was something we enjoyed but you're right it's that uh the social aspect of it all to meet your fellow peers that's terrific absolutely and not to minimize in any way just to also be able to get to meet my readers. As a, yes. as a person who writes children's books, I'm very, very lucky because I have more opportunities to meet my readers than any of the adult genre authors, because mm. only because I get the opportunity to visit schools. Kind of an amazing thing. And, and that is a big part of being on tour. I visited loads of schools and it was something I really missed during the pandemic. Book festivals are a way, but but even in the schools, I don't get to engage with my readers on an individual basis. I'm mm -hmm. talking to an audience of hundreds of first, second, third, fourth, fifth graders, right inside a uh, either auditorium or the big common room. But with a festival, I actually get to sort of engage one on one with a kid who comes to the table and wants their book signed and wants to ask me a question about how they can become a writer or like what you just did, how I came up with the idea for Bad Kitty or what else they can read, you know? So, so that's what makes books festivals truly special and just a unique opportunity for, for me and for readers and everyone involved. That's awesome. Again, you're listening to In Touch, Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley's Public Affairs and Issues Program. We have been speaking with Nick Brule, award-winning author and illustrator, best known for the Bad Kitty series. Nick Brule will be at the Poughkeepsie Public Library District's Book Fair happening April 1st, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Dutchess Community College's Falcon Hall. Nick, this has been an incredible, incredible interview, and I really appreciate your time. As we wrap this up, of course, please let people know where they can find you, whether in person or online, but also any last things that you want to share to the audience about reading or book fairs or any last message that you have. Um, you know, well, well, first of all, just to get out of the way, nickbrulebooks.com is, is a good way to find what I have. Even better way is to go to a local library or bookstore, especially independent bookstore, and just look for the books on the shelves. I would say my only final word is this is so much fun going to book festivals. <laughs> if you've never been to one, you are in for just an absolute delight because, you know, think about how exciting you always hear that the San Diego Comic Con is. Right. And mm. it is. It's it's a phenomenal event full of people who are all stoked about comic books and superheroes and all of that. Events like the Poughkeepsie Book Festival is about books and kids books. It has the exact same amount of enthusiasm, just with a slightly different theme behind it. So I hope to see everyone there. You are going to have a blast if you come. Wow, that's really awesome. Super inspiring. Nick, thank you so much for being here on In Touch. And for those who want to meet Nick, he'll be at the Poughkeepsie Public Library District's Book Fair, April 1st, 10 to 3, Dutchess Community College. Nick, again, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Connor. You did a great job with this interview. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Very kind. This has been this week's edition of In Touch, the public affairs and issues program that runs across Town Square Media, the Hudson Valley radio stations. We want to give a big thank you to Nick Brule. For more information on Nick Brule and Bad Kitty, visit nickbrulebooks.com and badkittybooks.com. Of course, all links and information can be found in the description of this episode. Thank you to everyone who listened to In Touch in 2022 and who are now listening in 2023. Whether you've been listening for a while or you just found us, thank you. Last year saw a lot of growth for the program, and we expect even more to come in 2023. You can find In Touch episodes new and old on your favorite streaming services like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and more. That and listen on demand with your Town Square radio station mobile app. Of course, you can still find all articles and audio under the In Touch tab on this radio station's app and website. And don't forget, we're on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram at 
in touch underscore HV. If you like what we do here on In Touch and want to be on the show, let us know. Whether you have a topic you want discussed or you want to be a guest, the best way to contact us is through our office number, 845-471-1500, or email direct to connor.walsh at townsquaremedia.com. Again, remember, Connor with just one in. I've been your host, Connor Walsh. Until next time, stay curious, keep an open mind, and as always, I'm glad we get to spend some time.